morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Renewing the Fight, a call to action for diabetes and chronic kidney disease, an online event by the International Diabetes Federation and the International Society of Nephrology. Well, as you know, diabetes and kidney disease are two conditions that impact an increasing number of people every year. They pose a challenge by, to societies and to sustainable social and economic, so IDF and ISN have developed a policy brief to highlight the links between diabetes and chronic disease and emphasize the need for a multisexual approach which can effectively prevent um, and care for them. Hi, my name is Anita Sabidi. I'm IDF Blue Circle Voices member from Indonesia. I'm also a type 1 diabetes and also chronic kidney disease, uh, so person with chronic kidney disease conditions. Um, okay. This webinar will be recorded, so you can activate Zoom generated subtitles for this webinar by clicking on the closed caption CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Please note these subtitles are not 100% accurate. The recording, slides, and feedback questionnaire will be sent to all registrants in a few days. Participants who attend at least 80% of this event live will receive an attendance certificate only if they complete the feedback questionnaire. So please check your spam folder to see if you have not received them by August 1st. And please use the Q&A function to post your questions to speakers and panelists. So here we are, we're going to hear a welcome message from the IDF president, Professor Akhtar Hussain, IDF president from Bangladesh, Norway. Colleagues and friends, I'm Dr. Akhtar Hussain the president of the International Diabetes. I would like to express my gratitude to Anita for your introduction. I'm afraid that the work commitments here in Norway prevent me from joining you live today. On behalf of the network of 240 national diabetes associations in more than 160 countries that comprises the International Diabetes Federation, I'm delighted to welcome all participants to this important webinar. Diabetes and kidney disease are growing concern that pose a significant challenge to health and sustainable social and economical development. IDF estimates that over half a billion people are currently living with diabetes. What we have seen, the number tripled in just two decades, which makes diabetes one of the fastest growing health emergencies of this century. The growing number of diabetes cases means that diabetes-related complications are also on the rise. This includes chronic kidney diseases, which is increasing but not receiving significant attention. We are delighted to have had the opportunity to develop this important policy brief with our colleagues from the International Society of Nephrology. This is an important collaboration as it provides series of recommendations that IDF and ISN are hoping can improve the lives of people with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. I hope IDF and ISN's network of advocates can make good use of this document for national advocacy. If action is not taken urgently, IDF estimates that the number of people living with diabetes will exceed 700 million by 2045. It is my honor to thank all the experts who have contributed to creating the, this document, notably Dr. Antonio and Dr. Rubato, who have led this group. We also want to thank our colleagues from the ISN for their sincere collaboration. I will now pass the floor to my colleague, Professor Nanga Ku president of the International Society of Nephrology, who will share some important data points on the prevalence and terrible impact of chronic and end-stage kidney diseases worldwide, as well as the factors driving 
the trends. Thank you for attending this webinar. Now, please uh, welcome from the ISN president, Professor Masomi Nangaku, ISN president from Japan. Welcome to the ISN IDF webinar, Renewing the Fight, a Call to Action for Diabetes and Chronic Kidney Disease. I am Masami Nangaku, president of the ISN. On behalf of the ISN, I'd like to thank all the members of the IDF for giving us this important opportunity. Kidney disease is important. At this moment, 850 million people worldwide are suffering from kidney disease. Kidney disease is predicted to become the fifth cause of death by 2040. 2.6 million people are being treated by dialysis or transplantation. And as you know, the cost of treatment of end-stage kidney disease is high. What is more important is that uh, between 2.3 and 7.1 million people suffer from premature death for lack of access to dialysis and transplantation. So it is important for us to realize this fact and to act for our patients. This is the analysis of Global Burden of Disease Study by WHO. As you can see, both diabetes and CKD are important components of years of life lost worldwide. In addition, the improvement of years of life lost in these two disorders have been relatively low compared with other diseases such as HIV or stroke. This is also the analysis of the global burden of disease study. This study analyzed the changes in disability adjusted life years due to kidney disease from uh, 1990 to 2016. About one half of the increase in disability adjusted life years due to CKD can be explained by aging. And another half of the increase in disability adjusted life years can be explained by population growth. Of course, in the high income countries, the main cause of this is aging while in the low income countries, the main cause is population growth. Then what about the diseases that cause the increase in disability adjusted life years? Diabetes is the most important cause in the increase in disability adjusted life years due to CKD. One half of the increase of disability adjusted life years in CKD is due to diabetes. And this is common from low middle income countries to high income countries. Even in low income countries, diabetes plays a significant role. Therefore, diabetic kidney disease is very important for us both for nephrologists and diabetologists. The ISN and the IDF believe in the importance of collaboration to address the shared challenges of kidney disease and diabetes on a global scale. Through joint advocacy efforts, ISN and IDF are working together to promote better prevention, treatment, and care for individuals affected by these interconnected health conditions. 
we have been partners in the advocacy. We recently published a white paper and a joint statement on universal health coverage. Thus, this is a very important webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to launch the joint policy brief on IDF and ISM called Renewing the Fight, a call to action for diabetes and chronic kidney disease. The ISM is the global, representative, diverse, and inclusive organization. It is through privilege and pleasure to work with the IDF. Thank you for joining this webinar. Thank you so much. And now we're going to start with the second scene. We're going to have Dr. Anthony Sariello, head research department, RCCS with Tiberica from Italy, and Dr. Robert Lopecoffio, professor of nephrology, School of Medicine, Pontifical Catholic University of Paraná, Brazil, and Research Scientific Arbor Research Collaborative for Health PSA for Brazil. Ten years. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, for the introduction. Uh, I am Antonio Ceriello from Italy, head of the research department at the Research Institute Multimedica in Milan. And I received the task, but also the honor, to lead on behalf of IDF this uh, very, very important initiative. Yeah, I, I, as you can see, the editorial team was formed by Anne Arsky, by myself, by Beatriz Janetsky Jimenez, Federica De Giorgi, and uh, Roberto Pecos Figlio, who is uh, representing the International Society of Nephrology. But also, we had the help of uh, top expert, or top worldwide recognized experts like Andrew Liu, Gloria Anshuntang, Laura Sola, Roberto Pontremoli, Salvatore De Cosmo, and Pierre Enric Group. So, a, a, well, a group of well, well recognized experts on uh, nephropathy, particularly diabetic nephropathy. Next slide, please. The, what, what about the policy brief? Uh, the, the idea is to target advocates, healthcare professionals, and policy makers. Highlights the links between diabetes and chronic kidney disease, emphasizes the need for a multisectoral approach to prevent and treat both conditions. Shared lived experiences of people living with diabetes and chronic kidney disease provides recommendations on the action required to improve the prevention of the care. If you want, you can download the policy brief just using the uh, what is uh, you find here on the, this slide. Next slide, please. You know, the, the statistics have been already reported by some of the previous speakers. Unfortunately, we, all around the world, we have more than uh, half a million people living with diabetes. But the key issue is that one or two is not, uh, not is undiagnosed. And uh, uh, three or four uh, live in uh, low mid middle uh, income countries. So it's a, a disease more specific for not very rich countries. And the cost is enormous all, the, all around the world, but we have data, for example, from the, the States, which is uh, 966 billion of, uh, of dollars. This is the cost of this disease. And more important, almost 7 million people die for diabetes. Next slide, please. And unfortunately, this, uh, you know, this uh, picture is uh, very well known, it's coming from IDF Atlas. Uh, the, the increase of a percentage, the prevalence of diabetes in adults all around the world is increasing. And this is a very, a, a really an, an epidemic and uh, must be uh, faced. Roberto, now is your, your, your turn. 
Thank you so much, Antonio. And uh, if, if someone in the organization could release my video, uh, that would be great. Well, um, I'll get started. And um, there we go. Just by saying that it is uh, an honor to be here representing the kidney community and the International Society of Nephrology in this important initiative. I wanted to start by um, just mentioning that the um, the numbers that Professor Nangako has uh, provided to you earlier in this talk are pretty striking. 850 million people uh, live with a chronic kidney disease, which is um, about one person in every 10 uh, people living in the world. The main reason that we are here together with the IDF today is uh, the fact that the main uh, group that is uh, susceptible to the development of kidney disease is the, the, the population with diabetes. Together with hypertension, they represent the main risk factors for this disease. Also important to highlight, and this is actually in the bottom corner uh, of the slide here, that um, kidney disease affects the racial minorities, women and elderly, which uh, all together represent a major burden to healthcare systems and a main cause of disparities. In the right middle of the slide here, you can see that not only chronic kidney disease is important in terms of being common, but also its impact on um, the longevity of the population is increasing over time. It has increased about 40% just in the last three decades, becoming uh, currently uh, one of the top 10 causes of uh, uh, mortality in the world and projected to be the fifth by the year of 2040. The other important thing is the fact that chronic kidney disease has become more and more important in low and middle income countries. And I'll show a little bit more details of that in the next slide, in which you can actually see the distribution of the impact of chronic kidney disease on that in different countries. Can I have the next slide, please? And uh, here in color, you see from dark blue to bright red, the distribution of the impact of chronic kidney disease in terms of you know, decreasing longevity of populations. And you see here that in the you know, light colors and also in the red and white and yellow colors, that a lot of this burden is actually concentrated in areas where uh, low resources are present. Uh, introducing very big challenges to countries in terms of dealing with this important problem and important impact of a common disease that affects uh, a large population. Let's see the next slide, please. And I'll let Antonio now talk to you about the main relationships between diabetes and the kidneys. Antonio? Yes, uh, maybe, uh, please. Uh, it's working. <laughs> yes, the diabetes, unfortunately, is the one of the leading causes of chronic kidney disease. The prevalence of the end stage renal disease is up to 10 times higher in people with diabetes. And pooled data from 40, 54 countries reveal that more than 80% of the causes of end stage renal disease are caused by diabetes, hypertension, or a combination of both. You know, hypertension, diabetes, very often they go hand to hand. What is really relevant is that the possibility to screen for albuminuria that should be done every year after diagnosis in people with type 2 diabetes and the same after the, five, the first five years in people with type 1 diabetes. In other words, we have a tool, a, a marker, which can help to understand and to, ca to catch right in time the appearance of some kidney damage. Roberto, next slide is yours. Thank you, Antonio. And I, I just wanted to, you know, to finalize our presentation just to emphasize a few points that I think are very important in terms of um, why is it such a priority for us to address chronic kidney disease in people living with diabetes. Next slide. 
The one thing that we haven't really mentioned that much is the socioeconomic impact of chronic kidney disease. Once a person develops chronic kidney disease, especially people with diabetes, uh, this actually impacts on a 50% higher cost for management of the, of the combined disease compared to diabetes alone. The cost is, this high cost is uh, driven in large part by advanced kidney disease management by dialysis and kidney transplantation, which create a very significant economic burden to healthcare. Therefore, preventing patients to progress to advanced stages and the need for this complex treatments is actually an important priority. And the most effective strategies to reduce this economic impact of diabetes and its comorbidities is to focus on early detection and prevention. Next slide. Also, I wanted to here introduce the highlights that the policy, policy brief, hopefully you have the time to review it and to read it and enjoy what we produced. Here is the highlights of a different way of addressing the problem of chronic kidney disease in people living with diabetes. First, we're trying to bring uh, with some clarity and data the importance of diabetes prevented, prevention as one of the main strategies. Of course, you know, the earlier the better and preventing the appearance of diabetes seems to be a very important and early on measure to prevent um, downstream consequences of the disease. Also, we wanted to highlight the importance of screening. Chronic kidney disease is silent. There is no symptoms in the early stages. So we need to really identify patients who need to be screened. And uh, obviously, diabetes, the, dia the population of people living with diabetes is one of the main populations that deserves active screening um, for chronic kidney disease and chronic complications. Also, I think it, it is important to um, really identify in patients with kidney disease the causes especially in patients with diabetes. And then very actively try to introduce the therapeutic approaches of uh, uh, chronic kidney disease in, pe in people with diabetes, starting with lifestyle mod mod modification and also introducing pharmacological treatments as early as possible because they are disease modifying therapies. Next slide. So let's take a, a look at just the, the main pillars of our document and uh, we'll be happy to answer some questions about it. So I think so far we have <coughs> managed to bring you the importance of chronic kidney disease as a, a main global burden that affects disproportionately socially disadvantaged population. We also talked about diabetes being one of the main risk populations and um, highlighted some of the other important factors like hypertension and cardiovascular diseases. <clears throat> and I'm gonna go just through a, just a, a few words about how to screen and diagnose so that this word can be disseminated across the globe. Because to screen and to diagnose uh, chronic kidney disease, we can actually count on very simple and widely available tests that measure kidney function, and measure kidney injury. So to measure kidney function, a simple test measuring serum creatinine, which is available across the globe at low cost, is an important way of doing this. And if you pair it with a, a urine test, more specifically, the urine albumin to creatinine ratio, this is a lab test, or even something that could do could be done at the bad side, as simple as a urine dipstick, could be very important tools uh, that can be used to diagnose chronic kidney disease and diabetes, and also strat stratify the future risk of complication, which is actually summarized in the next slide. So here in the next slide, you see what um, the, the healthcare community can use combining on top the different levels of the urine test results, and in the bottom, the different levels of the creatinine tests, estimating glomerular filtration rate, to generate what we, <coughs> what we call a heat map of future risk. 
So what you can see here is that the combination of these two tests allow us, allow us to actually uh, identify patients who are in the green collar, which means a low risk of progression to future uh, progression of chronic kidney disease, or patients in RAD, which represent the subgroup of patients just based on those two exams that have a high risk of progression to later stages and perhaps in the future uh, being exposed to a higher risk of reaching um, uh, advanced kidney disease with the need of dialysis or kidney transplantation. So with that in, in, in hand, with this simple stratification, we can actually go to the next slide and we can identify the strategies that are actually summarized in our policy brief. Can I have the next slide, please? And this is just... Um, a uh, description of lifestyle modification like promotion of physical activity, reduction in sodium intake, smoke cessation. Also, for this population, optimizing blood pressure and glycemic control are super important. And then we list here some of the pillars in terms of um, disease modifying therapies, like medications such as SGO2 inhibitors and uh, inhibitors of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system like um, ACEs, ARBs, and also non-steroidal MRAs, which currently are identified as evidence-based therapy to interfere in the progression of chronic kidney disease. So with that, I pass back to Antonio just to summarize some of the recommendations that you expect to see in the policy brief. Antonio. Yes, uh, next slide, please. So the key recommendation in the policy brief are, first, ensure intersectoral and multi-sectoral collaboration to develop policies and investments. Number two, collaborate with WHO to implement the Global Diabetes Compact at a national level. Then develop and implement intervention to facilitate diabetes screening across the entire population. Provide universal coverage to glycemia and glycated hemoglobin tests, glucose-lowering drugs, and antihypertensive treatment drugs. Develop and implement programs for CKD screening, risk stratification, and monitoring in people with diabetes. Provide universal coverage for drugs that reduce CKD progression in people living with diabetes. Uh, such as S inhibitors, R, SGL2 inhibitors, and MRA. Provide universal coverage for CKD care, including dialysis and transplantation. Include kidney disease specifically in EU and WHO targets, for example, in the political declaration on the upcoming 2025 UN. UN high level meeting or non communicable diseases. And finally, advocate for people centered care and involve people with diabetes and CKD, CKD in the development of intervention and guidance. So these are the key pillars of the document. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anthony Seriello and Dr. Roberto Picoac-Curio. And now we're going to hear Dr. Shefa Lucendal as IES and Efficacy Working Group for advocating for better diabetes and kidney disease care. Time is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Shefali Sandal. I'm a transplant nephrologist uh, from Canada, and I'm also a member of the ISN's Advocacy Working Group and the Emerging Leaders Program. Um, the goal of my talk is uh, how you can use this document to advocate for better diabetes and kidney disease care. Next slide. Um, our role as an advocate is one of the most challenging roles to define and adopt. Advocacy is defined by the World Health Organization as a combination 
of individual and social actions that are designed to gain political commitment, policy support, social acceptance, and system support for a particular health goal or program, a program such as this one we're all participating in today. Advocacy efforts can influence patient care, public health, and health policy. Next slide. Advocacy in the context of diabetes and kidney disease can focus on the management of patients, such as diet. This figure is from a consensus guideline on management of kidney disease in people with diabetes, and it encompasses the full spectrum of care from prevention to treatment. Each component is important, and in different contexts, different components may need to be advocated for. So I'll start with diet. It's critical for both diabetes and kidney disease prevention and management. Next slide. Diet is a crucial part of staying healthy when living with diabetes and kidney disease, but healthy diets are expensive, such as demonstrated in this very, uh, in this figure that I drew uh, with my daughter, comparing the cost of salad and water versus junk food. Advocacy is needed to ensure that everyone everywhere can make healthy food choices. In building an advocacy campaign to capture the attention of a policymaker, for example, a convincing message should be that if they spend a dollar now in promoting healthy diets in the population, they will get uh, a return of, on their investment of $11 in 15 years as people will be healthier. Next slide. Uh, another component, uh, another actually example um, of an important area where advocacy is urgently needed is the cost of therapies for both diabetes and kidney disease, which in many places is actually out of reach for people uh, who may have to pay out of pocket for nearly all their expenses. Next slide. Living in a high income country with a universal healthcare system, my out of pocket costs for the treatment of my gestational diabetes are very small. Uh, and you know, not just for insulin, but for the supplies that are needed to check sugars or ketones or albumin in my urine, as demonstrated in this picture I took last night. Without con good control of diabetes, complications like kidney disease are much more likely. However, I realize this may not be the case everywhere. The cost of insulin is concerning, especially given the fact that insulin was isolated successfully in 1923 by Dr. Frederick Banting and Dr. Best, and Dr. Banting sold the patent for a dollar as he said, insulin does not belong to me, it belongs to the world. Next slide. Yet the price of insulin varies substantially around the world and contributes to in inequities in care. In fact, for many people living in low middle income settings, it was sobering for me to read that 10 milliliters of human insulin can cost the equivalent of four to seven days of wages. Without good control of diabetes, complications like kidney disease are much more likely. Next slide. Even one of the most staple medications to treat kidney disease with diabetes, which are ACE inhibitors, they can cost up to $159 per month in some lower middle income countries. So advocacy is clearly needed to ensure that these basic medications for diabetes and kidney disease are affordable for everyone. Next slide. Now, the latter part of my talk will focus on how to build an advocacy campaign. Next slide. So there are several frameworks that may be helpful to structure an advocacy campaign. And I will highlight one such framework called the SMART framework and briefly use examples to show how this may be useful to raise awareness of the need to screen for kidney disease in all people living with diabetes using the data from the policy brief. So I'll start with the first one, which is the S. Next slide. The S in the SMART framework stands for specific. To build a successful campaign, one must have goals that are clear and specific and answer questions such as who will be impacted? Who is the target population? What do you intend to impact? Screening of kidney disease in people living with diabetes is important as early diagnosis will permit early treatments and will save lives. So screening campaigns such as the couple I've highlighted here organized uh, with the World Kidney Day Initiative to promote awareness of kidney disease and diabetes around the world are very, very important. Next slide. An 
advocacy campaign ought to have measurable and time-bound targets. In any campaign, it is key that progress towards the goal is being achieved, and the goals should be achievable within a realistic time frame. An example is the, the Global Diabetes Compact from the World Health Organization that has quantified targets for diabetes care that to be reached worldwide by 2030. Similar targets can be developed and integrated with this campaign to ensure that over time, all people living with diabetes are screened for kidney disease. Next slide. Screening for kidney disease in people living with diabetes is important because as highlighted in the presentations and in the brief, 45% of the 537 million adults living with diabetes do not even know they have it. And then out of those people who know that they have diabetes, unawareness of kidney disease ranges anywhere between 30 to 70%, depending on the population one is looking at. So if people are to be treated early to prevent complications of diabetes and kidney disease, it is critical that they're aware of their diagnosis. A measurable target is therefore important to establish. Next slide. To be effective, advocacy goals must be achievable. Therefore, it is key that all relevant stakeholders are engaged to ensure messaging and strategies are appropriate and acceptable. The Global Diabetes Compact has a clear engagement structure. Appropriate partners in each of these components must be sought to maximize the success of any campaign and to increase screening for CKD in people living with diabetes. Next slide. Uh, the reason the, uh, the, the R in the SMART free framework actually focuses on being realistic as well as the re uh, relevance. Screening for diabetes and kidney disease is important because individually, these diseases are important causes of death and increase the risk of cardiovascular death when you compare um, with patients who have no diabetes or kidney disease. However, on the top of the graph, I hope everyone can appreciate when you have both diabetes and kidney disease, the risk, the 10 year risk of cardiovascular mortality is 16 times higher and much higher than if you were to have one, one of them ind individually. Does the relevance of uh, kidney disease in people living with diabetes is blatantly apparent and early diagnosis and treatment can reduce um, mortality and other complications. Next slide. Ultimately, we must not forget what this policy brief very nicely articulated. The root cause of diabetes and kidney disease is multifactorial. And a holistic management approach to reduce the global burden of these diseases is needed. While this ho holistic approach may seem challenging, it is important and realistic to appreciate the intersectionality of some of these components. It is important to note that both are preventable and treatable through the life course with healthy lifestyles, access to affordable, equitable, and, and quality primary care, and with early screening and early initiation of some of these disease-modifying therapies that were previously talked about. Advocacy through professional societies like the ISN and the IDF, and supported by tools such as this policy brief, will help to develop specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound advocacy strategies. The ultimate goal here is to raise awareness globally that when one thinks of diabetes, one also thinks of kidney disease. With this, I'll end my talk and thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Shafali Sandal for ISN Advocacy Working Group. And well, now it's my turn <laughs> to share about my story about life goes on about after diabetes and chronic kidney disease diagnosis. Hi everyone. My name is Anita Sabidi uh, from Indonesia. I'm one of IDF Blue Circle Voices member. Next slide, please. I'm from Jakarta, Indonesia. And I have type 1 diabetes since 1987. So it's been 26 years with type 1 diabetes. I was diagnosed when I was 13 years old. I'm an artist, illustrator, and designer. And I'm a mother of two boys. 
I developed chronic kidney disease in 2015 due to pregnancy complications. So during my pregnancy with baby number two, I developed preeclampsia. Next slide, please. So when I was pregnant with baby number two, I experienced early contractions uh, during my 27 weeks of pregnancy. I also had hypertension, which led to preeclampsia. Um, since I was, since I have early contraction in the 27 weeks, so I have to extend my pregnancy. I was hospitalized for five weeks to extend my pregnancy to 32 weeks. And after I gave birth, I was rushed to the ICU because of my hypertension. And I was in the ICU for almost three weeks after birth. And I learned the hard way of my chronic kidney disease diagnosis. So after a full scan, uh, they find out that I have chronic kidney disease. And I also experienced some challenges, which is a limitation of the imaging equipment. So I have to be transferred to the national hospital for further imaging equipment. Uh, but yeah, uh, during my stay in the ICCU as a new mother with baby number two, I also diagnosed with stage two chronic kidney disease. Uh, with average of 65% and microalbuminuria of 6,000. Next slide, please. Um, one of the challenges that, that, I, uh, that I experienced when I was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease is the transition. Because for all of those time as a type one diabetes, I only focus on my carb counting uh, and my insulin dose. But when I was diagnosed with chronic disease, I have to learn further about the nutrients inside the food. Um, in terms of protein limitation, I have to limit my uh, red meat and also the, the potassium, the ureum, the purine, everything that contains the nutrients. So. At first, I was so afraid to eat anything because I'm really worried about my kidney condition. So that will be the, the hardest challenge for me on the transitioning as a newly diagnosed uh, person with diabetes, welcoming the new diagnosis with chronic kidney disease. And overall, I also have to manage my diabetes and hypertension. And during my first diagnosis, I have to, I, I do consultation with my team doctors, which I have a wonderful a team of doctors of nephrologists. Um, in the first two, three months, it's a two, every two weeks lab check to monitor my um, microalbumin level. And currently the status is my FGR is 83% with microalbumin area of 500. Next slide, please. Look for information. Um, the, hardest part, the hardest part diagnosed with chronic kidney disease complications is breaking the stigma. Because when I got diagnosed with diabetes complications, people thought it's the end of the world. And many people um, hesitant to look further for further information about it. Uh, so don't let the stigma breaks you. You have to look for information about the complications. Don't let it stop you. Uh, I have a wonderful team of nephrologists um, and also reached out to community. I know there are some members of my diabetes community also have chronic kidney disease. There are some who have do dialysis for the last 11 years. There are some who also uh, done kidney transplants and they are fine. And I know that I will be fine as well like them as I know that I can fight to get through this. And reach out because knowledge is power and consistent. You have to be very disciplined on your diet, especially because, uh, because now you're managing your kidney to slow down the progression of the complications. So the life goes on after chronic kidney disease diagnosis. Keep going. Okay, thank you so much. That's all for me. So we're going to start this discussion panel and Q&A. So we have 
Dr. Shifali Sandal, Dr. Roberto Pequafio, and Dr. Antonia Seriello. And the questions. Okay. There's a question coming. These questions refer to Dr. Antonio. Why do we need this policy brief? Because that we can prevent, in my opinion, the appearance of a kidney disease in diabetes. We have the tool to screen but particularly we have the tools, particularly some new drugs, which can really prevent the, the appearance and the progression of the kidney disease diabetes. This is why we have to raise the interest and the awareness about this issue, and particularly about the possibility that we can prevent, and in the case we can delay the progression of this disease. It's very, very important for the million of people. I think that you agree with me. Anita, I can see here a question in the chat that I can answer if you don't mind. Yeah, um, can, can. So there is a question about people living with one only one kidney. And if it is possible to live with that situation and not develop chronic kidney disease. Well, the first thing I wanted to say is that it is really possible. We have two kidneys originally, and um, uh, nature is wise because it allowed us to actually survive with a single single kidney. And this is, uh, I guess, good news. Uh, that situation could be something that people are born with, a single kidney could develop in in as a consequence, for instance, as a you know, repeated uh, uh, inf infections of the urinary tract that might destroy a kidney. Um, people can have cancer and have it surgically removed. And all, all the situations leave people with, um, with a single, living with a single kidney. It, it is important that, you know, the reduction in the in number of organs, of course, puts you at risk. So you, you are at higher risk of developing uh, a progressive chronic kidney disease, but this is not really something that happens uh, to all. And I think um, there are strategies actually to reduce the risk. We learned a lot from this, from the world of kidney transplantation. You know, kid kidney donation is another reason for people to live with single kidney. Donors of kidneys, they can live a long and healthy life without developing chronic kidney disease. And this is the base for uh, living kidney donor programs. Um, and uh, But one thing that I would say is that all, all of the strategies that we discussed and that we wrote in the policy brief are what to do to prevent progression of chronic kidney disease, you know, uh, prevent prevention of diabetes, control of diabetes, control of hypertension, a healthy life. They are even more important living uh, in people living with a single kidney being diabetic or not. May I have a question for uh, Sandal? Sorry for <laughs> you. I was really impressed looking at the cost of uh, drugs for, like say, for example, ACE inhibitors or ARBs in some countries, because in uh, many, many countries, they are very cheap. The uh, uh, generics are available. How is this possible that the, the, the cost for the treatment for this, to buy these drugs is so high in some countries. It's a really, sorry, I was really astonished. Um, it's a combination of factors um, why the cost of drugs vary so much. Um, for example, in, in the US, 
there was a actually a huge advocacy campaign that was built around the cost of insulin, which has increased 60, 600% over the past 20 years. Uh, so um, it, it often has to do with, um, you know, a lot of bureau, uh, bureaucratic um, uh, like problems. So, um, but this is where advocacy campaigns are so important because we can really leverage support from patients and from the policy briefs such as this and advocate for um, making some of these medications perhaps even freely available uh, to, to uh, people who are living with diabetes and kidney disease um, and uh, making them more accessible because at the end of the day, the return of investment uh, might be might make it absolutely worth it. And I can see another, Anita, another question in the chat here that I could um, address. I think it's an important one. Uh, uh, you know, the question is about um, in a disease that has multiple risk factors related to the, you know, the, the progression of disease, if, if really controlling glucose is enough in terms of strategy. And I can take that, that, the, that question. Um, okay, by, thank you. Is yeah. a tosar um, definitely not? It, it's really not enough, and it's very important that we disseminate the information that a multi-layered approach to preventing progression of kidney disease is, is necessary. So, just controlling diabetes is not going to solve the problem and prevent you from having the kidney complications of diabetes. You would need, um, especially for type 2 diabetes, hypertension is so commonly associated as another condition and an important, another important uh, factor to be controlled. So controlling hypertension and, uh, and, and the lifestyle uh, modification that was emphasized by Shefali and, and Antonio are so, so important, you know, uh, exercise, uh, losing weight, uh, stop smoking is so important on top of controlling diabetes. And the third layer yes. that we can't really forget is that they are, they are drug treatments and they are super important. And, you know, there's yeah. a lot of evidence that they reduce the, the risk uh, independently from blood pressure and diabetes control. So really a drug treatment for patients who are eligible and who can tolerate that it's it's very important, and we have about you have basically three main class of drugs that uh, can be used in that. Um, ACEs and ARBs, they are blood pressure drugs. They are they have very important and positive kidney effect in diabetic patients. Uh, SGO two inhibitors, the gliflozins, are also important, and they have yeah. evidence to prevent the the progression of complications. And more recently, yes, uh, non steroidal. Uh, MRA. So there are three classes of drugs approved for use that should be introduced in patients who are eligible. And then how can screening can be done efficiently to prevent chronic kidney disease and reduce the chronic burden? So if I did, do you want to take this? Uh, sorry, can you repeat it? There was an echo. Sorry. How can screening be done efficiently? To prevent um, chronic kidney disease. Well, one of the earliest, um, uh, the, the, there are two very simple tools at our disposal, a blood creatinine level and protein in your urine. And these actually, uh, you know, we can pick disease early. Uh, we can screen patients on um, on a mass scale with just these two simple tests and, and initiate treatments. So just these two tests, blood creatinine and um, protein in your urine. That's one of the most effective ways, uh, but in in general, also blood pressure checks. You know, seeing the primary care physician at least once a year are all all very effective ways to implement um, uh, picking uh, screening for kidney disease in patients living with diabetes. Yes. And then, what's the safe average blood sugar level? 
uh, it depends on the units you're using uh, because we use different units. Uh, so uh, for fasting blood group, and it also actually depends on um, your underlying um, uh, you know, disease, like in pregnancy, the, the targets are a bit more strict. But um, what we tell patients is that we measure something called hemoglobin A1C, uh, which um, normal is less than 6%. And in patients who have, uh, uh, people who have diabetes, we target 7% or below. Um, and day-to-day uh, -day variations of sugars vary, again, depending on your underlying, uh, underlying disease. If you have gestation diabetes, for example, the targets are quite strict. And it also depends on the units that are being used in your country. Okay, okay. another another question. Will that be okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so people decide not to take some medicines for diabetes control since they feel that these drugs will lead to kidney uh, conditions. Is, is it is it is it is it correct? Okay, now uh, may I answer? Uh, yes. You know, all around the world. There are people who believe that the medicine are not good. Uh, and also, I failed to face this, but uh, I think that there is not an answer, the only meaning that the only answer is to explain what is the situation, what could be the benefit of the, of the medication, and explain that without the medication, we probably would, be, would have been. In like uh, uh, let's say hundred years ago, where it was enough just to have a, a bacteria infection and you will easily die. Today, with antibiotics, you can survive. Even okay, we are producing more problems with the resistance, but this is another very special specialized situation. So really, the um, the growing in knowledge. The, and in setting new drugs, which really are helpful, the studies are there, can help today to prevent particularly kidney disease. In my opinion, the only way is to um, explain, to try to convince, but also to have a group uh, activity. Because see, I'm sure that if somebody who is reluctant can share and speak, the experience with the others who had, who had a favorable experience, it would really could help a lot. Yes, thank you so much. And what? why do you think there are so many patients undiagnosed with diabetes and chronic kidney disease? Uh, I didn't take that one. Uh, I think it's lack of awareness. Um, and it's um, like non-communicable diseases in general have been relatively sidelined over the past decade because resources have been channeled towards other global priorities such as HIV, TB, malaria. Um, while all these conditions are very, very important, there is a, a you know, like a global recognition for these uh, two conditions, uh, especially because of the pandemic. What we saw in the pandemic is that uh, patients who had di underlying diabetes and or kidney disease and got COVID had worse outcomes and uh, than the ones who didn't. So, um, you know, these two conditions carry uh, the highest risk of death and complications, actually, one of the highest risks of death and complications. So that's why I, I think um, efforts such as these are needed to ensure a meaningful change can be made. Um, yep, that's what I'll add. I don't, I don't know if you, Antonio. I can take another okay, question you, here that I think it's yes. very important from the chat. Yep. Uh, so Priscilla Daniel is asking if all patients with type 2 diabetes will develop chronic kidney disease. And, and the answer is no. It's only part of them. Usually, you know, patients who are, have that diabetes under control and they they do all the preventive measures, like you know, uh, you know, engaging in a healthy lifestyle, exercise, diet, they are at lower risk of developing. And uh, but there is only about uh, one third of patients who develop uh, chronic kidney disease, and and uh, uh, just a, a fraction of that will progress. And that shows that there is there is hope 
that some of the treatments that are being introduced, they are helping people not to develop chronic kidney disease. Thank you. I would like to also ask about uh, what do you think about the traditional medications about for diabetes and chronic kidney disease? Because I think in, in most Asian part of the country, they still pursue those kind of medications. The problem is that uh, I know that in some countries, for example, in China, there are also hospitals for uh, traditional medicine and so on. Uh, I am not completely against, but of course the key issue is that no one of these has been uh, tested in a controlled yes. trial. Yes. Uh, this is a, a really a, a, a huge barrier. As a doctor, I have to be honest, if I have to choose between, I have the possibility to choose between traditional, a very well established treatment tested with the trials and the experience, of course, I will be easily in favor of the second choice. So this is, uh, I'm not, a, what I mean, I'm not a, against, but we need proofs. You cannot just say trust without proofs. And to prove that, you need randomized controlled trials, which usually have not performed with this, uh, with this, this treatment. Actually, I have another question. It's coming from me, actually. <laughs> Since I have chronic kidney disease, and um, I, I started thinking about the trans transplanting, uh, I mean, an idea of the kidney transplant. I mean, since I have an autoimmune condition, it will also affect my kidney transplant one day. You may or you may not. Uh, many people uh, with kidney disease have stable kidney function uh, for the rest of their lives. Um, and uh, it, 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 the pathophysiology of this disease is quite complex, but it is the, the progression is determined uh, by how early we diagnose, uh, diagnose it and how we manage it. So uh, it's not necessarily be the case and you may live your entire life without ever progressing or progressing to a point where you don't need dialysis or a kidney transplant. Okay, another question. Um, depending on the severity of the chronic kidney disease, drug regimens, including those for glycemic control, do you think dietary intake may require adjustments? Yeah, I can take that. Um, yeah, yeah that diet is important, but very different di dietary advice uh, needs to be applied to different stages of chronic kidney disease and yes. diabetes. So in the earlier stages, the most important thing is actually to use your diet to better control your diabetes, to better control your blood pressure. And that is the main strategy in terms of diet is trying to reduce the sodium intake. That's salt and also sodium that is present in a lot of preserve, preserved uh, foods. And also a healthy diet that allows you to, you know, be on target for weight. So that's the early phase. When kidney disease progresses, then complications of chronic kidney disease develop. And especially when your kidney function is really low, the kidneys have the function of excreting some things that start to accumulate and cause problems. So you might need some restriction in other, uh, other elements which are in food, like restriction of uh, phosphorus, uh, rich uh, uh, foods and also potassium rich uh, foods. Yes. And at that same stage, uh, reducing, especially animal protein intake is an important strategy that can actually improve your symptoms and actually reduce the progression, the, the progression rate of kidney disease. So yes, diet is, in, is important, but it is not the same advice that you need across the spectrum of severity of chronic kidney disease, as I mentioned. Agree with you. Yeah, because I remember that I have to also to limit my uh, intake on processed foods because they may contain other um, substances that will endanger my kidney condition. How far does the patient emotional behavior like depression, anxiety, and stress impacts over diabetes and chronic kidney disease progression? Anyone would like to answer? 
Uh, I can take this one as well. Mental yep, health disorders you. definitely um, are a risk factor for disease management. Um, and there are, you know, it's something that we are slowly appreciating, but we see it in our practice all the time. Mental health disorders do contribute to um, medication non-adherence, um, non-adherence with follow-ups, and just, you know, negatively affect the well-being of anyone, anyone, and not just, you know, patients with uh, yes. living with diabetes and kidney disease, but anyone. So they definitely do affect. Uh, the treatment regimens. Having said that, um, again, the a healthy lifestyle, uh, exercise, you know, these are some of the, the uh, simple ways of, um, uh, you know, like encouraging uh, yourself to be in nature, um, et cetera. But anyone who's struggling with mental health disorders really should be seeking the right avenue for help, which is none of us three, uh, but somebody with the right training. Um, and um, yeah, and uh, you know, expertise to really guide them. But we we see it affect the the treatment regimen and the adherence of our patients. So it is important, very important. Yes. I understand that diabetes with chronic kidney disease has high risk on cardiovascular system. Apart from good diabetes control, is there anything else regarding chronic kidney disease to reduce cardiovascular risk? Uh, yes, there is a very well recognized link between uh, kidney and heart. One of the best examples is the link between the heart uh, heart failure and kidney disease. This is a, is a very complex interplay, but this correlation is uh, very well established. Usually people with kidney disease are at higher risk for the cardiovascular events. At the end of the day, the strategy is uh, uh, no different from uh, any kind of an, any different strategy you must apply in people with diabetes, because anyhow, you, and to do best to prevent cardiovascular disease. And it's a really important to know that almost all the drugs used to uh, treat kidney disease are also very helpful in preventing cardiovascular disease. So yeah. you really get two birds with one stone choosing the right uh, treatment. Yes. Yes, I remember because when I was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease, I have a lot of meds to manage my uh, conditions, uh, such as in heart condition, also in my uric acid level, including my um, blood aggregation. So it's, it's just to keep my kidney condition as, 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 as it is without any um, progression towards worsening. Uh, the next question will be, how can the ROI on prevention be projected to give both patients and policymakers a chance to make a durable change in disease management? This is why we are here. <laughs> so we, we try to do our best. The idea is that uh, probably to give an instrument to be used. This is something that uh, really helps uh, to, have to approach the healthcare system uh, who has the responsibility of the healthcare system in, in uh, the different countries. Of course, this is a very general document for, uh, and unfortunately, you must go locally and to discuss according to local policy, to the local reimbursement policy, uh, insurance contract. Uh, so it, it is a, it's really important and necessary to do this activity at, at country level, but I'm sure that this document can be helpful as basis to start to discuss because it's uh, evidence-based. Thank you so much, Dr. Antonio. Wow, it's been a wonderful question and answer session. So many <laughs> information taken. 
And this will be the last question as a closing question for all speakers. Uh, please share 30 seconds of the main key message regarding chronic kidney disease in people living with diabetes and this policy brief. Maybe I'll get started here in the time. Yes. Um, okay. So I think um, my, my message is um, that, you know, that everybody should join the fight of chronic kidney disease in people with diabetes. I think there's a lot of communication between different, you know, sectors of healthcare, primary care specialists, and a lot of information developed by this stakeholders, but without engagement on other people, you know, advocates, policymakers, and, and patients themselves uh, in this fight. I think the we won't we won't won we won't won win the war and um, and improve improve life of people with diabetes, preventing complication. So this is a call to action and a call to action of many people, not only doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, but um, everybody interested and involved in this, including people suffering uh, this disease. Thank you so much. Probably Dr. Antonia or Dr. Shefali would like to continue. I think that Roberto really was uh, concluding in the right direction. There is uh, no, no one, no no one can skip to support this initiative because you are speaking about a very serious complication, and I think that also we are speaking about the quality of life, which <laughs> means to have this kind of a complication. So. If we want to preserve not only the health, but also the quality of life, it's very important to intervene, or to intervene as yes. soon as possible. Thank you, Dr. Antonio. Dr. Shivali? Yep. Uh, so my um, main message for everybody who is on this call is, again, just to emphasize the global impact of diabetes and of kidney disease in patients uh, in people with diabetes. Um, just, the, just the numbers that were presented uh, should be relevant enough for any country, any, any policymaker, any physician, and any community. I, I think that uh, this policy brief can really be used as a tool to advocate for uh, grassroots level type of in interventions uh, centered around screening or management or uh, just um, you know, just initiating things like uh, walk for kidney or uh, or uh, healthy lifestyles, etc. Again, as as highlighted, the root cause of diabetes and kidney disease is multifactorial. A holistic management approach to reduce the burden of these diseases is needed. But you know, there is an intersectionality. A, a bunch of these things uh, are are related. And uh, so um, any, it, it's important to appreciate that and it's important to, to know that targeting, uh, initiating one management strategy can target uh, both these diseases and perhaps some of the other um, non-communicable diseases as well. Um, and again, it is important to note that both are preventable and treatable with healthy lifestyles, access to affordable, equitable uh, care, and early screening and treatment. So uh, advocacy through professional societies um, like ISN and IDF uh, will uh, hopefully provide the leverage um, to, to do so in one's uh, own setting. That would be my parting message. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shivali. Um, the closing message for me is probably when you're diagnosed with diabetes and chronic disease complications, don't give up. Don't hesitate to look for information pursue your um, medication, break the stigma. I mean, having complication doesn't mean it's the end of the world. You can keep going and striving. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you so much for attending this online event by International Diabetes Federation and the International Society of Nephrologists for renewing the fight, a call to action for diabetes and chronic kidney disease. You can download the policy brief by scanning or downloading uh, the link. Uh, it will be circulated via email together with the webinar recording. Um, you can, as you can see, there's a QR code to be scanned. 
for downloading the policy brief. The recording, slides, and feedback questionnaire will be sent to all registrants in a few days. Please respond to the feedback questionnaire to help us improve future IDF online events. If there are any questions, you can have and send it to advocacy at idf.org. Thank you so much from all the team of IDF and the ISN team. We look forward to see you all in the next online events.